I would hope not. Not at this point. <laughs> <laughs> this is RadioOnFire.com giving you more talk, more news, and more music. I go by the name of Don McKay, and I am joined by a special guest. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Joy T.J. Riley. How are you doing? I am excellent. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, we've been having uh, a bunch of authors come through and um you know like, tell their story talk about books and um and all that kind of stuff so that's what we're going to do today uh you have a lot of pieces here and we're going to get into that uh but first let's let's start with you where are you from um i'm originally from pennsylvania okay. but i grew up in the dc metro area so okay. the dmv as okay. we call it so you like go-go music <laughs> yes i still like go-go music okay okay <laughs> okay um so i met chuck brown Okay. Once. Okay. And um, so he was like a real live, in the flesh, cowboy. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and so so that was cool. But um, <laughs> uh, so I I listened to some go go music and okay. um, you know DJing a lot. Of course, I've done a lot of parties where we've had to play go go music, and then I've done events with bands. And so yeah, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm definitely I'm familiar. Okay. Okay. Uh, so so you grew up. And basically, you're going to say you were raised in, in the DMV. Yes. Um, did you read a lot as a child? Actually, yes, I did. Uh, it was uh, another outlet for me, um, as well as writing. Uh, writing and uh, reading both became outlets for me uh, as a way to channel uh, the aggression that I had from uh, suffering from okay. child abuse. So I I'd suffered traumatic events of child sexual abuse. So you, you channeled that into the writing, actually into the mm -hmm. writing. Was was that the subject of the, the writing or just the intensity level? Just the intensity level. Um, are you comfortable talking about? Yeah, that's actually my second book. Uh, I interviewed uh, several survivors of childhood sexual abuse and they felt comfortable enough you know by me being a survivor telling me their stories for the first time absolutely so you know and that's the whole point of it how um i mean how did it stop actually remembering something that was said to me somebody said if somebody tells you don't tell you need to tell right. that's why the title is right. Shh, don't tell because right. every survivor hears that so that was the deciding point for me. Um, and as a lot of people, um, both male and female, have to, uh, you know, endure um, this type of trauma. Um, you said that this was your uh, topic of your second book, not mm -hmm. the first one. Why? Well, because I think God wanted to go in a different direction um, to talk about the fact that there is healing possible, that there is purpose. And I started this book first, the second book first. I started it first, but he said, no, you're going to table that. You're going to talk about me first because he is first. Okay. So. So um, you, it seems like a lot uh, about you is spiritual based. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. Okay. So uh, you have a strong religious background. Uh, I didn't actually grow up in the church. Uh, I didn't grow up in the church. I had been exposed every once in a blue moon. Uh, I can remember when I was nine years old, one morning I woke up and I just said, I want to go to church. My family looked at me like I was crazy. Oh, wow. Where, where did that come from? <laughs> well, I think it was a combination of things. Um, the neighbors and the neighbor's kids, they all started going to the church down at the corner. This is when I was still in Pennsylvania. And, you know, they were going every Sunday and they were coming back and, I said, you know what? I want to learn about God. And my great-grandmother, bless her heart, she didn't go with me, but she stood on the porch and would watch me walk down to the church. So I went by myself wow. at nine years old. And I went to the church house. It was a Methodist church. And um, I sat in on the service for the first time. And then I found out that they were doing um, Sunday school for kids. And so somebody asked me, did I want to participate? I said, absolutely. So I went down and, uh, you know, I really loved learning about Jesus. I really loved learning about him. Um, I went to a Methodist church several times with a, um, a woman that I, I was engaged to. Okay. And I had always been to Baptist churches um, and I 
also gone to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, uh, Kingdom Hall with my mm -hmm. grandmother. So those were my only exposures to. So Methodist is slightly different. Um, mm -hmm. How would you how would you describe that? difference between Baptist uh, church service and a Methodist church service? Baptist is a little bit more lively. So, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but then you have your differences within, within the Baptist churches because some are more livelier than others. Um, some are very, you know, staunch, educated, and, you know, well, we have our degrees, our papers, yeah. this, that, and the other. But the most important reason why you are in the house of God is to experience the presence of God. Oh, listen to you. So <laughs> I'm going to just, I'm going to keep it real okay. with you. <laughs> I'm going to keep it real. That's the, because the word says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. So we're supposed to come together corporately. Yes, we, you know, look, the word says that we can't escape God's presence even in the pits of hell. So we can't escape God. But we're also supposed we're supposed to come together and worship God on one accord. That's the whole purpose. But if we're so busy worrying about what suit and what hat we're wearing and what shoes we have on, instead of coming to God as we are in spirit and in truth, so that we can connect with Him on a more deeper level, then it's just a place. And lose focus of the of the real mission. Exactly. Um, Going, I guess, going full circle, when when you wrote about whatever you decided to write about when you were younger, uh, was this in the form of a journal? Were you writing with the the idea that you were going to, you know, release books one day? No, actually, that wasn't even the thought. The thought was, I just I had a creative spurt, but I was also angry, and I needed to write it down while I remembered. But then I guess when I was in uh, sixth grade, I actually wrote uh, a short story and my teacher picked that short story to be performed oh, wow. by a high, school, um, a high school drama team called this the Rainbow Troop. The Rainbow Troop. Mm -hmm. So this was a good, this was it, a good story. Yeah. This wasn't a, uh, okay. And so it was really just about How did that being, feel to, for that to happen? It was great. It was the day before my birthday. <laughs> So that was like, happy birthday to me. But at the same time, I still never imagined that God would take uh, experiences and say, you're going to help other people through your struggles. So no experience is wasted. You know, Romans 8 and 28 says that God uses everything for the good of those who are uh, called according to his purpose. Right. So basically... It doesn't matter what you're going through, good or bad. God's going to use it in some way, if you let Him. To help there's lessons else. in everything. Exactly. In, uh, right. Uh, how how much support did you get with your writing, aside from you know the teacher? Uh, but throughout high school, uh, I had other teachers um, submit my work for poetry contests. Et cetera, et cetera. I think I did win, I think I won, was it second or third place uh, in a poetry contest uh, when I was still living in Virginia. And then it also got published in the uh, high school newspaper. So it was always there. I just didn't see it as something as big as God saw it. I didn't see that because I was still fumbling around with my own hurt and pain. I yeah. was still looking for God. The, um, the, the transition from, I guess, hobby to mm -hmm. somebody who actually has something published, how, how did you make that jump? Wow. Uh, God's great at kind of setting you up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's how it happened for me. It was more of a, a setup. Like I said, I used to, um, when we were talking off air, um, I used to send out devotionals to a group of people and it was, you know, family, friends, et cetera, et cetera. But I used to send out everyone else's stuff. And then one day God just stopped sending everybody else's stuff. Oh, wow. And said, I've given you something to write and you need to write it. And I basically told him I wasn't going to do it. And you know how that turned out. 
<laughs> I lost that battle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't see how you could win that one. Yeah, yeah. That just that wasn't gonna happen. So that's really God made the jump because God said either you're gonna do this or you're going to feel it, and I felt it in my physical body. I felt oh it in the form of sickness, and it kept going. I couldn't shake it. Couldn't shake it. It, and he had been talking to me for at least three weeks about two devotionals that I had to write. And I just was like, oh, yeah, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. He said, no, you're not going to get to it. You're going to do it. So the minute I started typing, everything cleared up. It was like it was like, shh, it was like a vacuum. You just got sucked right out. You actually felt better. Yeah, as I was typing. So... When Ezekiel's talking about, you know, it's like fire shut up in his bones. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that, that's powerful. Um, and then continue. What, what happened? Well, uh, you know, I started, you know, just doing the devotionals. It, it was a daily. It went, in, it went from those two to doing it five days a week. And then next thing I know, it was maybe what? It was, let me see, that was March. I had already been told by at least two other people that I should be writing a book, and I just really wasn't hearing it. But I think the kicker for me was the third person. The third person was the, the president of the company I was working for. And he and I had gone out to lunch for my birthday. And he said, you know, you really need to be writing a book. I don't know what you're waiting for. And I said, you know what? If I hear that one more, one more again, one more again. One more again. <laughs> one more again. So I was like, all right, God, all right, God. I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. I'm, I'm going to stop him and that horn. I said, okay, God, so what am I going to write about? So I literally started writing about, you know, the child abuse. And, and I started doing that. And then he said, no table that I already gave you material you've been working on it for nine months and I had no idea that get your joy in the morning was really a setup so for nine months I had been writing a book and didn't know so you had the material already I already had it uh, obviously uh, well received prior to you publishing it uh, after that what what's been the response I've gotten to the point now where um, God has said too many people were using it instead of the Bible. They were supposed to use it in conjunction with. And so they were becoming so dependent upon it that God said, you know what? You're not going to be doing it as much. Well, as I give it to you, that's when you'll give it to them. It's not going to be every day anymore. They're never going to know when it's coming. You talk to God, or God talks to you daily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. All I the can time. tell. I can tell. So multiple times throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Very good. Very yeah. Good. So the message, there'll be a message whenever He says there's going to be a message, and that's how it is now. I mean, I've had people who are, you know, well, are you still doing it? Are you? Well, where is it? I said it's. It's coming. As God says, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what was the what was the timetable in between uh, book one and book two? Wow. Let's see. Book one was published in 2011, and then within six months, I was working on book two. So, as I started book two, the direction I started it, and God said, "Stop. You're gonna throw all that out, and you're gonna start over." Oh, I said, wow. "What?" I was 30 pages in. I was like, what? He said, yeah, you're starting over. You're not doing it this way. So he gave me the introduction. He gave me part of the introduction. And he said, but I need you to sit down with someone because this is bigger than what you think. I said, okay. And he started giving me the visions of what the what the title was, what the cover looked like. I gave them this design. I told them what this what it was supposed to look like. And then they just they went with it. But God said it's going to be a film. And he said, and you're gonna interview people. I said, I'm gonna do what? I can't interview not on this topic. God, I can't do this. This is what you're gonna and he actually told me 
who to contact. Very powerful. How, where were you with your own experience when you were writing the book? Had you, um, had you dealt with it? Yes, I had dealt with it. So for me to have to go back through those doors in order to reconnect with the interviewees, it was difficult. Um, as a one emotional. of emotional, yeah, very emotional. Uh, a girlfriend of mine, she said it looked like there was a cloud. All she saw in my spirit was a cloud. She said all I could see was a dark cloud over you. Mm. So that's literally what it was like. And I had, and let me tell you how powerful God. Matter of fact, God stopped the get your joy in the morning message then for me to focus on it because I was hemming and hawing again. <laughs> uh, yeah that's that's uh that that's pretty powerful so you you have big plans for this book yeah so there's going to be some visuals attached to this yes because that's the only way people can really understand it you can put it i mean you know i i actually had several people in the beginning say well you maybe you just need to make this a play i said no you can't get across the the level of terror that a child goes through in a play and meeting with that production company i met with the production before even sitting down she helped me understand the president of a production company she helped me understand that when you write she said joy you need to write it as though it is going to be a movie so that it's easily translatable to a screen. That's play. true. That's true. So by me sitting down with her and, and she really helped me understand the difference between film and a stage play. And she said with a stage play, the words are the main focus. And then you've got the visual to help support it. But in the film, it's more about the visual and the words are to support it. Yes, she broke that, she broke that down very well. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, we were talking a little bit uh, pre-interview about um, writing mm -hmm. and um, talked about my experience a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote my book for me. Okay. I realized that. Well, I wrote it for me and for uh, for him, uh, the son that uh, I had for 11 years. But um, so my motivation was at the time I had not been able to talk to him and I wanted to express everything uh, as if I wrote it as if he was going to read it. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so but it was it was strictly for me. Later, I've come to see other people, of course, I knew that had experienced, you know, similar things. Uh, and then it became something that could help other people. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was strictly for selfish reasons. Mm -hmm. what, what's the motiva what was the motivation for you writing this book? God, Shh, said, uh, God said that I had to write it so that other people could, number one, understand what happens um, because there's there are long-term effects that at the time when I was going through nobody understood what the long-term right. effects were right. and so God said you have to address the change that takes place once that happens because it's a seed of destruction and God said you have to help people understand that it's meant to destroy the spirit of that child. It's an attack on the spirit. People just look at it from a physical aspect, but there is a spiritual and an emotional aspect that is affected. Right. So right. he said that I had to, number one, talk, you know, get them to be aware, but also to help other survivors. So, yes, it took me to a new level of healing, just like, you know, just like what you said about your book. Right. But the overall goal, God said, it was never really about me. That's good. He had to, he showed me something. 
I had gotten really, I know I talked about being nine when I first went to church, but I did not give my life to Christ till I was 16. And I had been pulled back into the church by a high school girlfriend, been begging me, begging me, begging me. And so I finally went. Well, within a month after being baptized into the body of Christ, I had the most terrifying nightmare. And in that nightmare, I heard the devil for the first time in my life. Speak. Speak. And his goal was to kill me. And he said that was the goal. But prior to that goal, what God showed me was a skyline of children being destroyed and there were bodies of children linked together across the skyline. And I heard the devil say, you can't save them all. And you were how old at this time? 16. Okay. And so by the end of the dream, I was alone, no family, no friends, and the devil literally was trying to kill me. I did not make sense of that dream until I started writing this book because the demonic forces that I had to deal with were pretty fierce. It's, it's amazing that that dream has stuck with you all this time. Yes, it has. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it. That's it's very powerful. How, uh, how can people get these books? Uh, there's several ways. Um, they are pretty much available wherever books are sold. So whether it's, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, Books A Million, or on my website, doesn't matter. Uh, wherever you feel more comfortable buying books. Um, but my website is www.getyourjoyinthemorning.com. Yeah, that's just, it just feels good to, to get your joy in the morning feels good. Yeah, it, it feels good. But that was, yeah, that was, that was, that was from scripture, Psalm 30, yeah. verse 5. Yeah. What, uh, what else do we have here? <laughs> you, have, you have something else here? Uh, yes, actually, I do. I am also the writer for the literary therapy section for the Divine Voice magazine. Okay. It is based out of Atlanta, but we have just contracted to be in every major city in the U.S. and Canada. Okay. That's so. Big. I am actively looking for authors who want to be showcased and they can buy an ad through us and then I will write their review. So they send me their books and I'll, uh, I'll write a review. That is wonderful. And how can people get more information on how they can take advantage of that with you? Um, actually, they can either um, contact me through my website, www.getyourjoyinthemorning.com or uh, email getyourjoyinthemorning at gmail. Dot com or 443-297-7795. That is wonderful. So uh, doing a lot of big things, I see. What is next uh, on your uh, agenda? <laughs> well, on uh, July 9th, uh, I have an event going on in D.C. called the Community Book Signing Event and Panel Discussion on Child Abuse Prevention. It is a... Uh, Safe Shores 2020 event. Safe Shores is the DC Children's Advocacy Center. I am an ambassador for them as well. And so uh, there will be a panel discussion with, uh, with Safe Shores and a couple other people. Um, a woman named Brandy Hill who has a master's in forensic psychology. So basically studying the psychology of crime. And also uh, Miss Taria Powell of Good Life Radio on the Leap of Faith Network. And she is a early childhood advocate in uh, Ward 8 in D.C., but also a long-term foster parent. So she sees mm -hmm. on the other side. Definitely. Yes, and myself. So we will all be there on uh, Thursday, July 9th at Busboys and Poets in Brooklyn, uh, across from Catholic University from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Free, uh, free to attend. That is wonderful, and, and it's a very... Uh, needed thing yeah definitely um, and once again people can find out more about you at your website yes uh, anything you want to say before we 
before we get out of here? I just want to say it's been a pleasure yeah, sitting so down talking with you, and I look forward to reading your book. You are not the father. Right, right. I look, I look Definitely. forward to it. I'm, as, as we talked offline, you know, I am a big advocate of, you know, people being honest and. Um, you know, I do believe in the spiritual law in Galatians 5 that you shall reap what you sow. Yeah. So when people sow deceit, it shall come back to harvest. That is true. I think um, I think in that particular situation, I think that's something that, that is um, definitely manifested itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Definitely. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, social you. media. Are you on social media? Yes. I'm also on uh, Twitter um, at get joy, the letter in the morn. Um, I'm also on Facebook, joy, TJ Riley and the get your joy in the morning page. So you can find me on there as well. Um, so I, I also have the blog, get your joy in the morning dot blogspot dot com. So I'm able, you can find me pretty much anywhere. Okay. Wonderful. I am, um, at the diamond K show on, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And um, definitely uh, stay connected with us on social media, Radio on Fire, also Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for your chance to win prizes and surprises. It's been a pleasure sitting here with you. Thank you so definitely. much, Don. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. All right. All right. Stay tuned. I'll be back in a few.